Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be exploring. Nope. I why did I why did I say explore? I've never once used the phrase exploring ever, ever before. Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of John Wayne Gacy again. This is part two of a three-part series. If you would like to be able to get the backstory of everything. That has kind of happened up to this point, especially here in the interview. Go check out video number one. Let's go ahead and roll the intro first, though, yeah? Okay, as I stated in this previous video, again, this video is brought to us by, well, observe, it's brought to the, us by the merch. I, I have some new merch, and you should go and check out the new merch. Uh, we worked really hard on the designs over there, so if you would like to be able to go and check those out, purchase anything, and if you do get those things, send them, post us, uh, po post us, tag us on social media so that we can see that. It's kind of cool if you're into that sort of thing. Anyways, that's all the shout outs. Let's go ahead and dive into the content of the video. When you paroled out, where did where did you uh, set up uh, establish uh, your residency? I was I was under the interstate compact. I was paroled back to Illinois, mm -hmm. and you went to Springfield first, did you not? No, no, directly to Chicago right because Chicago. I had a job working at Brown's Restaurant. That was a requirement of a, of interstate compact transfer. You had to have a job and a place to stay. I moved in with my mother in the condominium. I had my dad had just passed away, so oh. I, I I lived with my mother. Okay. And worked at Bruno's as a chef. When I first got out on parole for the next two years, I stayed with Bruno's restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I worked for them. But on the, on the side, I used to work from, I used to go in at four in the morning and get off at two o'clock in the afternoon. And to me, that was too short of a day, mm -hmm. not enough work. So I started doing odd jobs painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that on the weekends, the afternoons and the, and the weekends, I was making more money than I was as a chef. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause and just make a note about, again, we're seeing Gacy heavily focusing on talking himself up in this situation again as he's talking about how, oh, well, I used to work this shift from four to two, but that just wasn't a long enough work day for me, so I had to go and get more work. Again, it's another area of superiority that Gacy is trying to enact on the people around him, and he's now going to explain how this made a transition for him, but... Just pointing that out again, we're still seeing these characteristics continually throughout the entirety of the interview. Let's go. Even though I was getting uh, 12 something an hour, uh -huh. I borrowed $600 from my mother and through odd jobs, I left the uh, chef business. I, uh, I own PDM contractors. PDM was able to work 52 weeks out of the year while most construction companies set, shut down for the winter. I never had time to shut down because I had them on a waiting list. Our business was growing at that rapid rate that Somerdale House was rented to PD. Again, he's trying to inflate his own. More or less, this is still his own ego, even though it's his company that he's talking about. It's still something that he is proud of. He's worked on things like that. So he's still inflating his own ego on this side of things. And this is in line with many serial killers. They do often have a very grandiose point of view of themselves. So this is falling in line with what we would expect to see. Let's keep watching. Rented to PD of contractors. And like the living room was the front office, mm -hmm. the dining room of that house was like a boardroom because it was a, a an eight by a ten foot table with big caps and shares because we use it as a boardroom for meetings. John, the media has, has has called you a homosexual killer. What is your position on homosexuality? I have nothing against it. I'm a, I'm an outspoken liberal. I don't care for uh, the uh, the labeling. I don't care for any labeling for that fact. Do you claim, I mean, to, be a, been, do you claim no. to homosexuality? No, I, I would uh, definitely not be uh -huh. homosexual. Uh, I have nothing against what they do, and I... Okay, so this is an area that's a fairly important question, and one that just doesn't... It's one of these areas where we know it doesn't line up with his actual actions. But during this time, what we're able to see non-verbally is he starts breaking eye contact substantially in this area in a way that he wasn't before. This is a spike of activity from the normal resting state of his baseline before. So he starts breaking eye contact a fair bit. The micro shakes no are synchronized with him saying no. 
along with that, we're seeing some disgust reflected in the corners of his nose and the drawing together and lowering of his eyebrows. That can be a patient in the form of anger. And he's denying the lifestyle despite there being evidence pointing in the other direction. So it's a fascinating area. We are seeing a spike in nonverbal communication. It would serve as a red flag. Now here, obviously, retrospectively, we can say that uh, it would serve as a red flag. It was one. But just the spike in that nonverbal communication would serve as that. Let's continue watching. And I, I don't deny that uh, I've engaged in sex with males, but that I'm bisexual. They're bisexual? Right. I My preference is women. And I've been married enough times and, and have children, and mm -hmm. I see nothing wrong with it. My dad had conservative values. If you're out after midnight, you're up to no good. My dad did not believe it. If you're out after dark and you didn't leave a phone number, you were up to no good. So I think that's why I tended to go that way more, just to be the opposite of him. I was married. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and pause there. He does make a, a note and the difference between being homosexual and bisexual. So that that does kind of make sense into context of what we were seeing earlier. But then we're still seeing those desynchronization points and his nonverbal communication. That also being said, he then brings in that his father was from a very uh, conservative point of view and that they kind of stood at odd ends of that. So this is another area that just allows us to understand some of the, the building blocks that Gacy was functioning off of as he performed and carried out these pretty terrible acts. So let's keep watching. I was married twice and just because I didn't get along in the marriages. My marriages went down the drain only because I was a workaholic, working uh, seven days a week in that. There was 12 keys out to the house. 12 sets of keys? 12 sets of keys. Anybody working for PDM contractors had a set of keys for the house. So you could come and go when you want it. And of course, my neighbors would keep me informed. They would inform me, God, while well, you were out of town, they, they must have been partying all night there. Who is Rossi? Michael Rossi was an employee of PDM. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how old was he at the time? Who was he? He was 20 years old. Insofar as being bisexual, if I wanted to engage in sex, Rossi and Cram were willing to go down on me anytime I wanted to, providing they were given stuff. Now, when the when the search warrants were affected in your case, uh, they did they did find an awful lot in the crawl space of your home, did they not? Well, yeah, I had offered to sell them the house because I, I thought there was nothing down in the crawl space. Yeah. I had never uh, had any qualms about them going down in the crawl space. Well, how many bodies were there? All that I want to be able to point out. So all of the, the prior the portion there that I maintained silence, it was quite synchronized. There wasn't too much to be able to point out. And also it wasn't too incriminating in regards to the case itself. And now we're getting to this part here. We're talking about the, the bodies underneath the house. And we're hearing a spike in his his pitch and tone. So, well, uh, well yeah. And that could be an indicator of agitation. It could be an, an indicator of anxiety and stress. And this would make sense considering the question in itself. But then also it lets us know that since he is stressed on that one, we might be able to anticipate seeing more stressed behaviors just because that would fit with what this line of questioning is. But then we still have to be able to understand that spikes from that either above or below are still important to be able to take note of. So just things to to make note of as we're continuing forward. Bodies were actually located on the property and where? To my understanding, there was a total of 29 bodies or 28 bodies mm -hmm. were found on the property, 26, 27 of them under the house. And the rest? One was under the driveway, one was under the garage. So that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Now, uh, uh, from the standpoint of the arrest, when you were arrested in the Very good with number recall. And in this area, he seems to be having difficulty recollecting the exact number. Now, that is fascinating to me because earlier on in this very interview, he's been able to recall dates and and from from far back in his history and specific times and things like that. So that he's having difficulty recollecting this doesn't fit with what he has shown his capabilities to be in the past. And this seems like it would be a detail that would be fairly important. What I feel like this specific instance is, is Gacy trying to present that he's not super familiar with it. So he's inserting flaws into his own recollection it's oh it's this or this maybe it's this or this and it even is inconsistent in his telling of it as he's able to be like oh well there's one over here and one over here too but i i certainly can't remember how many there were it feels like he's trying to to uh, intentionally add flaws to his narrative to make it to where he doesn't sound like he knows what he's talking about just find that fascinating that he is trying to do that let's keep watching next when you were arrested in this in this matter uh uh this it's one, snowballed it's it's snowball okay what what uh, was the date of that arrest do you recall 
uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. The rope trick is not, uh, the way I've just, again, just here shortly thereafter, again, we're hearing another area where he just rattles off numbers very easily. He's done it before. It's very easy for him to do. But in this area with the bodies underneath his house, he, he really can't be bothered to remember it at all. Almost seems as if it's too intentional. Let's keep watching. The way I've described the rope trick is it's nothing more than an tourniquet. Mm -hmm. And I had explained it to them. I even demonstrated it to them. We cut off the air. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to kill somebody, you you just put it on their neck and twist it three times or four times or whatever until the person stopped moving. And you took him where? Out on the I-55 bridge. And that's where, uh, how was he then taken from the car and placed into the into the river just opened up the trunk and nothing man mm -hmm. okay. there was there was no there was no big special deal I, yeah i couldn't get down in the crawl space that easy and then i had a bum back to begin with you got to crawl on your belly to move around in the crawl space there is no way that i could have done any of the digging down there i had enough trouble just getting down there gregory gregory Gradsick, um yes he I'm not sure. I can't really attest to the physical condition of Casey during this time. I will say that he himself is a, a contractor, and he himself acclaimed to his his tireless work ethic and being a workaholic. And so this this statement of I couldn't even get down there myself just doesn't seem to fit in with his character. So this is uh, less likely, in my opinion, as well. And and. That also does not fit. If he's guilty, he would obviously be familiar with the the underside of the house where he's put all of the bodies. So we're seeing this pattern that showed up, and then we're knowing that it does, in fact, plug in with the actual future evidence that would be coming in. But let's just keep watching from here. Yeah, seed number four. Gregor Godzik had came come to work for me in 19, uh, according to this, 1976. He came to us through Taft High School through a program. He had worked for a Republic Lumber Company, and then he came to work for us. Well, now I'm not the monster image that's been portrayed. Obviously, this is extremely edited and broken up, and it's a little difficult to follow the narrative of this. I apologize. And again, though, what we're seeing is another instance of Gacy having a fairly strong and impressive memory recollection ability in regards to these various small details, even down to these ones that he's recollecting here. So this is still just painting us a very clear picture of that contrast between the two. Let's keep watching. Trade of me. And the only way you can make a monster image is, is to make it look like I stalked the streets and picked up altar boys off the street. You know, they want to make them look like innocent babes in the woods, and I was swatting them like flies. My encounters were always by happen chance. If you pull up at a stoplight and there's somebody standing there waiting for a bus, if you give them a ride, if you ask them whether, you, you know, do you get in anything or you want or want uh, drugs or something like that, that's how it happened. Always a uh, happen chance encountered. A number of, uh, what, three or four psychiatrists, psychologists interviewed. I had 13 of them. There was six for the defense and seven for the uh, the state. Yeah, well, what was the, the state position doctor, of the defense uh, psychiatrist? What what did they feel your problem was? Uh, what did they come up with from the standpoint of our... Uh, border, uh, what the hell is it? God, I can't remember offhand. Borderline personality, Antisocial behavior. I don't see how anybody could be antisocial when when we were involved with the public as much as I was. How about the the uh, multiple personality issue? Oh, the multiple personality in uh, came out of uh, Dr. Reifman and Hartman. These two clowns from the uh, from the uh, Cook County there. They came to see me the first time. I said, "Do you want to talk to John Wayne Gacy, the the politician, the clown, the family man, or the businessman?" The next day, I see it in the newspaper. Gacy has four personalities. I think one of the headlines... I'm going to go ahead and pause here because just a number of things are happening, and it's fascinating all the way around. First, again, Gacy recollecting details and numbers off the drop of a hat without any issues, and then when it comes to other areas where it feels like it could be more incriminating for him, he suddenly has difficulty recollecting it with i don't know it may have been antisocial personality now perhaps it's because gacy is good specifically with numbers that is the possibility 
That still doesn't clear him of earlier where he could not remember the number of bodies and where they were. But in this area, I still just find it fascinating. It is still just adding more and more weight to that earlier. And now we're also hearing him talk about the psychologists and what the psychologists believed and, and presented him to be experiencing throughout that trial. And it seems to line up fairly well with what we're able to see even in these past couple videos with his characteristics, especially considering the borderline personality disorder. All of this does make sense. So let's keep watching. We're able to see what John Wayne Gacy really functioned as, as opposed to this image that he presented himself to be. So here we go. I think one of the headlights said that was a homosexual mass murder, confessed mass murder. There is no confession. And we offered, uh, uh, I offered as much as $10,000 if you can produce a confession where I confess to a crime. The time that I was interrogated by the police officers, there was no stenographer, there was no tape recording, there was no videotaping. Nothing was ever taken down, yet everywhere you'll see there's, there's five confessions by John Wayne Gacy. Now, if I confess to something, then why wasn't it videotaped? Why wasn't it recorded? Why wasn't the stenographer brought in, had it written up and had me sign it? There is no confessions in this case. What I did not know about this insanity defense is that in the state of Illinois, when you plead not guilty by reason of insanity, you're saying that you committed the crime, but that you were insane at the time. So it's not a question of innocent or guilt anymore. What, what they're trying to do is your whole trial now becomes a, an insanity trial where you're, you're to decide whether a person is sane or insane. John, how about uh, Tim McCoy, the last one? Of the five? Just going to go ahead and pause and make note of the fact that he is aware of the moving mechanisms behind the trial, the pleas, the deals, and everything that is going on in that as well. So obviously, again, a very intelligent person. And some of you in the comments of the last video brought up that he could have definitely also just been preparing for this specific style of interview, maybe not known the exact questions that were going to be asked, but had enough time to think and ponder them to be able to present them so quickly and easily. There is also that possibility, but we're also able to see a level of nonverbal seepage as well that's giving us some some ideas as to the behind the scenes of his brain. So let's keep watching. The last one of the five that you say you had personal knowledge of. Tim McCoy, even though he's the last one, he's the first one. He's the first one, actually. Right. The first of the 33. Tim Tim McCoy was, was the first one, and... Uh, Tim McCoy's name wasn't put on him until 1988. Prior to that, he was known as Unknown Number Nine, and he was buried by me in the crawl space. That's the only knowledge that I have of it. What was the circumstances of that? He was killed in the house uh, in self-defense. And who killed him then? I stabbed him. Yeah, and it was a, a mat, an issue of self-defense. Why, why was, was he in the press assaulting you, or, or what? He was coming at me with a knife. I just took the knife away and twisted in his hand, and that, that's what killed him. So at, at, at that point, uh, you, you yourself did bury him then in the crawl space. Right, and if you if you notice, he's under concrete. Did you bury any of the others in the crawl space? No, I had nothing. To, I, I had no knowledge of him. Yeah, well, why, why is it that? All right, so what I want to be able to make note of non-verbally is while Gacy is discussing this instance of him stabbing another human being, he's not showing any level of emotional reflection from that. It's not flashing across his face on any level now. Perhaps he's just detached mentally from it, so it's not showing up in that way. I do find that fascinating, and then I also find it fascinating that he does just try to, like, really quickly skate on by the fact that even still he's admitting that he did stab a person and bury them under his house. He, he tries to squeeze by that and start pointing out some of the differences or the flaws to excuse his case, which lets us know where his priorities lie. So that's frustrating to see. And then we're also seeing him have a, a large burst of nonverbal activity in regards to this. Did you bury any other people under there? And he shook his head. It, it was a micro shake, possibly. It was a fairly decent size, so it could have been controlled. There is that detail to keep in mind. But then he also has a substantial burst in self-soothers and a little bit of a postural change. He breaks eye contact, and that's all centered around this. He also now has his hands open in a very open pleading gesture while he's talking about, I didn't even know about that, and his pitch increases. And, and this is all obviously a, a massive spike in his nonverbal communication. And it would make sense for a couple reasons, but it's definitely something to be able to keep track of and keep mind of that it does pop up in a very important area. 
and there have been some other inconsistencies throughout the interview. All of this is important data. Let's keep watching. Why is it that yours, your, your first one is there and then, you know, 20 some uh, others are, are buried down there as well. Did somebody know that you had done this with the first one, that giving them an ID? More than likely one drinking and getting high with the others, yeah. Admitting it to them. So you feel others then followed your suit in, in uh, using this as a burial ground? Without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, just, to, just want to highlight. Without a doubt, shaking his head no. Now that could easily be related to the you wouldn't believe, without a doubt. That would make sense. It could also definitely be a point of desynchronization, especially considering the context in which it's found. He also is looking down and off to the side with that. And he hasn't used this phrasing without a doubt anywhere else. And then along with that, the, the pitch and force behind his voice also falls off a fair bit. What I'm feeling is the case here is the, the reason that we're seeing some of these uncertainty tells, the lack of force, the lack of pitch, the breaking of eye contact, the little micro shakes nose, as we're seeing these, that could be an indicator that Gacy himself doesn't feel like the, the presentation that he has here, the story that he's trying to push doesn't make so much sense that maybe, maybe he did this one time, this one singular time, and that was just an anomaly. And then somebody else that he told while drunk or high, it, was, it then started a train of events. Either another person is a serial killer or a lot of people have killed a lot of people and are just using his house as a body stowaway. It's so out there and complex. One person has already killed and stowed one body underneath the house. It would make sense that they could do it again, especially if they have a pattern of behavior that's trackable in other areas, which they do. Anyways, let's continue watching. I want to highlight uh, um, on uh, John Zick. You know, they want, they want to make such an issue over John Zick and his disappearance. I think he was killed for his car, personally. And your, and your personal knowledge of this of the Zick uh, uh, case, then, is... Uh, is uh... My personal knowledge of the Zick case is, is that I had come home and Zick and Rossi were at the house. I had a few drinks. I went to bed. When I woke up the, the next morning, Rossi was sleeping on the couch and Zick was dead on the floor. Uh, I went about my own business and he was gone later on. And where, where did he go? Where did he end up? I assume he ended up in the crawl space. You, did you see him being transported down there? No. Wasn't present. Didn't do the, didn't do the transporting. But when he was dead, he was dead on the floor? He was dead on the floor, yes. And did you have never say anything with anybody about that? No. In other words, I just, uh, I just. It seems very, very nonchalant for talking about waking up and coming out into your living space and there being a dead body on the floor and somebody else sleeping on the couch and then saying that you saw that and decided to go about your day. I just find that I find that fascinating behavior. Also, non-verbally speaking, we're again not seeing any level of emotional reflection as to the circumstances that he's speaking up. Now, there is obviously the possibility that there is that um, that emotional disconnect in his mind. He's not experiencing it or allowing himself to experience it emotionally, so it might not be reflecting on his face. There is that possibility. And it hasn't strayed from his baseline from everywhere else that he's been speaking. So that gives me the feeling that this entire interview is extremely controlled from Gacy. It is still fascinating to make note the fact that he has shown no remorse. He has shown no guilt. He has shown no shame. He has shown no sadness or grief or pain on any level in regards to the victims that were being spoken about. And everything has been very focused on himself. Fits with what he actually is, but important to point out. Let's keep watching, and then we'll we'll just wrap up. I just uh, I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to get involved. Uh -huh. My idea was to just stay out of it. All right. So his idea was to just stay out of it, which would have been the safest way to go about things had things played out the way they did. Now, obviously, there are some complexities in this case, and there's another entire video coming out after this one. So if you're interested in being able to see that, please let me know in the comments of this. If you do have any other requests, let me know in the comments of the video. I'll hopefully be able to, to get to most of them if possible. So uh, thank you for, for doing that in advance. Again, go check out the merch if you would like to purchase any of that. Tag us in the socials. You, you, you heard that earlier. Uh, if you like this video, hit the like button, uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell if you want to, and, uh, you know, do, do all the rest of the things. 
But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for today. My name's Logan, and you have been oh so awesome as you always are, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Thank <music> you.